we are giving this talk today together because um, I am the expert for some very um, exciting technology at Eclipse, a runtime technology actually. And um, for those that find technology boring, we have the better part of the talk uh, given by Robert Blusch from the UBS uh, Bank in Switzerland. And he will demo it uh, in the context of a real application that deals with large amounts of data. Okay, in the morning you have learned um, how to use EMF. Um, Ed talked about X-Core, which you can use to um, model data structures, for example, um, on a very high level, independent of technologies. And um, you've seen briefly that EMF generates very nice code for the models you've um, designed. So you might ask yourself, what else do I need? But believe me, when you start to use this cool code and these cool models, and you want to build a real application out of that, that you operate in an enterprise with large amounts of data, with many users and um, concurrent processing and all these things that um, are relevant in, on a large scale. Then there are missing certain pieces like um, scalability, so dealing with really, really huge models, uh, transactionality, uh, threat safety, the ability to query remote servers and all these technical things that are really orthogonal to the um, business modeling layer. And <clears throat> the CDO model repository tries to, um, to help you with all these challenges. So let's first have a look what are really the problems with a um, traditional approach of using EMF applications with XML file-based persistence. There's a number of problems. Um, you don't have to read all this. The most important ones are probably <clears throat> you, you don't have transactional safety. Yeah. Um, another very important problem is that it's very hard to deal with large models. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to unload objects once you have loaded them from XML files. Um, the, the main problem is that the garbage collection uh, does not really work because the models are usually so tightly interconnected that it's impossible to get rid of single objects. Um, summary of all these um, points is the XML file-based approach doesn't scale very well and it's not very um, well suited for multi-user access which you definitely need in enterprise applications. So with CDO, <clears throat> you don't store your model instances in files, but you uh, commit them into a model repository. And normally you have a lot of application instances that connect to the repository. And when the application modifies uh, single objects by calling setters on them or uh, the list mutator methods uh, that are generated by EMF, then you can commit the CDO transaction and only the changes are transferred to the server and optionally the server can notify actively all the other clients so that they invalidate their copy of these objects. And <clears throat> when these other applications try to access these objects because they are calling the getters or the list accessors, then they are transparently reloaded from the model repository. So in the model repository, when such an application commits changes, then we store versions of these objects and the default mode of the repository <laughs> replaces old versions if new changes come in. There is an optional mode of uh, a CDO repository which we call auditing and with this mode all the former versions of objects are kept in the database and you can use this data to uh, go back in time and look at consistent states of your models 
compare them, see the deltas, how did the data evolve over time, and all these things. And a third mode called branching, which you probably know from systems like Git or CVS, SVN, adds a third dimension to the data stack in the repository. So this data in the repository, if I go back one slide, you see that the application in the upper area uses uh, circles to indicate objects, while in the repository we have these uh, rectangular um, bullets. We call those revisions, and they are a little bit different from objects. They um, store some system data, like uh, in what branch has the data been committed, um, at what time periods is it valid, and so on. And on the right side you see that the real modeled data um, is stored in an object typed array. So this is uh, why CDO, like most other EMF technologies, is called a generic or reflective technology. It doesn't rely on the generated code. There's a small transition layer um, at the top of the application. So let's have a look at uh, how a CDO client looks like usually. The, main, the first thing you have to create is a CDO session, which is over a network protocol connected to the repository. A session has um, a separate package registry, which uh, lazily loads packages from the server when they are needed. And one of the most important parts is the revision manager, where all these revisions that are lazily loaded from the server as well are stored. Um, but we have already seen that these revisions are not EMF objects, and your application certainly wants to deal with objects, not with these internal CDO concepts. So there's missing something which turns these revisions into objects. And we'll have a look at that with an example of one object, the object with the ID 1. And the missing concept is what we call a view, a CDO view. A view looks to a certain branch in the repository at a certain time and selects the appropriate revisions for a, for a given object. In this case, this type of view always gives you the latest version of an object. There's a second type of view, which we call an audit view, and you can configure a timestamp into this view, and then it selects historical revisions and shows you a consistent historical um, state of the object graph. Um, the first two views are read-only. You cannot call setters on the objects when you want to change the model. Then you must open a transaction, which is also kind of a view, and also shows you always the latest state in that branch. But when you call a setter on uh, this object here, <coughs> then the revision is uh, copied into the transaction buffer. Um, then you can edit it, the change, the delta is recorded by CDO. And when you commit that transaction, all the deltas and the new objects are sent over the wire to the server, persisted in the database, the other clients are notified. And now have a look. All the views that show the latest state of a branch automatically switch their pointer to the latest revision. <clears throat> and that makes all the applications in the network automatically update their UI. You don't have to do anything for that. So how ca can an EMF object work like this? It's uh, not the way you would expect it, right? So let's have a brief look into an object. This is from the, from the library example that uh, ships with EMF. And by the way, the fourth, the last reference here, the, the, the author reference to another writer, that is usually the problem for models to scale to large numbers of objects because it tidily connects them together. As soon as you have set this Java reference, you can never get rid of that writer as long as the book is in memory, right? So what are we doing in CDO to uh, solve this problem? We use a generator property to simply cut out all the fields from the generated classes. That property is called reflective feature delegation. 
that's nice. Now our objects have no references in between and the garbage collector can remove any object. But all the data is gone, right? So we use a second um, generator property to insert a, a new base class for all generated objects. This is uh, the CDO object implementation, which again is an e-object implementation. And such a CDO object has always four um, fields. Um, a, technically, a technical ID, which is assigned by the server to identify the objects. The second one is this revision pointer, which you've seen, which we can quickly and easily switch um, from older to newer revisions or vice versa if you travel back in time. Very important is the state. So each object is maintained or maintains a state machine where the big hyper state persistent um, always starts in the state new. When you commit a transaction, we've seen that already, an object transitions to clean. When you call a setter, it goes to dirty. Committing it makes it clean again. Um, this is the event which we've seen on the very first slide when the repository notifies other clients. Then these clients change the state to the proxy state. And when a getter is called, it's loaded and goes back to clean. Um, <clears throat> it's obvious that when you have applied local changes to an object and this remote event comes in, then we go to the conflict state. There are also possibilities to hook in conflict resolvers that you can bypass the conflict state, but normally you leave it by just rolling back your transaction and doing your changes again. So this state machine is really in the heart of a CDO client and CDO enabled EMF application. Let me go quickly through this. Um, your generated classes um, normally extend CDO object impl and we call that CDO native models. It's also possible to um, store dynamic objects in a CDO repository. So you can, at runtime, create a meta model dynamically and create dynamic instances of this model and store it in CDO, in the repository. Both these are native models. Sometimes you have models uh, which you can't regenerate. We call those legacy models. And it's possible to use them too in CDO. Then you don't have all the scalability benefits because they are not regenerated but at least you can store them and load them from the repository. Typical example are GMF diagrams or so. Okay, there's one special implementation or subclass of um, this CDO object, and that is our internal file system in the repository, which is really just an EMF model that we have, you see it here, we have regenerated it for CDO, and that serves as a file system in the repository, in the database. This is uh, <clears throat> just an example uh, for the fact that CDO is really mostly a collection of APIs, of well-designed APIs with hopefully good implementations. The user imp interface that we ship is more f to play with it, like um, a generic SQL uh, front end or so. But the focus is on good APIs and efficient and stable implementations. Um, there are some new additions to the CDO framework. For example, you can cluster your servers. By the way, I didn't mention that the databases don't have to be relational databases. We have adapters for object-oriented databases, NoSQL databases, in-memory databases. That's very flexible design there. You can uh, cluster multiple repositories for uh, server-side failover reliability. And you can um, even create offline replicates of um, server repositories <coughs> to shield you against network failure. Now, there are lots of other things. So you, I think you get an impression CDO is really there to help you to master all the technical challenges once you've, you've designed a nice business model. Um, Finally, before I hand over to Robert, I would like to show you some of the 
real life applications where CDO is used. I have the feeling that the video does not work here. Well, so I have to explain it. The NASA, for example, uses CDO to let, I think, about 20,000 um, engineers for the next Mars mission to collaborate in real time on their schedules. It's a, it's a distributed planning tool. Uh, the Canadian Space Agency, oh, here, here it works, um, deploys CDO to uh, to robot units um, and they all commit their sensor data into a repository which is distributed to all other robots so that they um, know how the other robots feel. This is an example from a Swedish company. They uh, do physical simulations, uh, chemical si sim uh, simulations, where they author the problems uh, in teams and commit the problems to a solving farm where multiple computers solve the problem and commit the solution back. So this is really a collaboration tool. And this is um, the handover slide to Robert, which, yeah, maybe, do you want to say a word to this? Yeah. Okay. Okay, as uh, I can mention, I'm working for UBS as an IT architect. I'm not responsible for business application or client-facing application. I'm responsible for the whole tool chain supporting the software development lifecycle. We're a big organization. We are all over the world. We have an IT in the States, in EMEA, as well in Switzerland and they all use different tool with their own data store and changes in our industry and a lot of regulatory rules which are coming we, uh, forced us to think about the modernization of our tool landscape. We looked around and we decided that we go in direction of a corporation with Eclipse. So the first thing we did, we looked what's around and we did research. And one important thing is that instead of having a lot of different repository databases, we want to store our knowledge of our IT system model-based, so we had the requirement for a model repository. That's why we went in the direction of CDO. What I show you now is the first implementation which went productive in November 2011, which shows some aspect how we try to collect information of our IT system and store it model-based in a repository. Sorry. Okay, as I told you, we try to capture all enterprise relevant assets and store them as model. All those information are stored in different legacy system. For example, we have an inventor which is totally disconnected from the daily work of our IT employees. This inventory stores all our IT asset, how our system is decomposed into subsystem. Another thing is that we have responsibilities. For example, each part of the system has an assigned architect or has assigned lead developer. Those information is stored in a different system and we try to bring those information together at the end to provide a holistic view of our IT landscape. The current state, we are productive since November 2011. What we did is mostly set up the development infrastructure with continuous integration. So we use Maven and Tyco for our builds and we use Jenkins as a continuous integration server. 
Our CDO repository runs on a Solaris server and we use Oracle as the data store where we store the data for the CDO repository. We develop the client provisioning via a UBS specific installer and for the update for the client we use the P2 update site mechanism. Currently we have three features available. The UBS component model which describes our application architecture. Then the SSP artifact model which uh, we do reverse engineering for all artifacts we found on our mainframe. The, all the important business application, the end of day processing, the end of month processing, as well as all the, our customer and contract are stored on a mainframe. They're 30 year old COBOL program and uh, the knowledge get a little bit lost. So we need to understand our system to then uh, modernize and do new things with it. And what I already mentioned, the identity model, which we stores all the employee with their roles. So now I will show you some live demo of our RCP application with connects to the CDO repository. The goal was that we leverage all the functionality the Eclipse platform provides us. So we use the integrated help system, we use the cheat sheets, and I will show you all the things we did. So on the bottom we have our identity model, I already explained it. Here we have a model which stores all the employees, the association to a specific part of our IT system in a specific role. Then we have the second model, which is the reverse engineering part, and the UBS component model, which describes our application architecture. So a short overview of this UBS component model. It's a hierarchical structure which uh, the top level is so-called application system. The application system <coughs> on this concept a lot of policies coming from the application architecture are defined here. The idea is that in our IT system, application system should be loosely coupled. So we have strict rules how an application system can interact with another application system. An application system can be, for example, a system which maintains all the internal employee, or another system is a system which maintains all our customers with their contract they have with the UBS, or Another system is, for example, a credit system which handles all the credits customers have with UBS. Then the second hierarchy, the application component group, this is a logical grouping of software components belonging to the same layer. For example, here we have a, a grouping of all front-end related components belonging to a system or we have a grouping of all components belonging to the data processing for a specific system. And the lowest level, the application component, this is where the actual implementation is going on. So when we look from a role perspective, the architect, they know, they know application system. The developer, they know application component. The problem we had in the past if a developer implements something and needs interaction with other system and the information to which system the specific code belongs to, it's hard to decide if he choose the right interaction pattern. Maybe he thinks the database belongs to his own system and he 
writes or reads directly into the database. This is everything possible on a mainframe system because it's on the same physical system and it's easy to have a lot of cross-system interactions. Okay, so I showed the integrated help. As well, we use the functionality of the cheat sheets. So now I log in to the repository. Ike explained that with CDO, all the strong references get replaced by weak references. This allows us specific ports, specific fragments. This allows us to load specific ports out of a huge model. As well, on one slide, he showed the possibility of doing query on the model. So I show you here the functionality, how we can query things on the repository. I just put my name, hit enter, and it search on the repository, and the result is my specific object where my user profile is stored. This, there are different possibilities for queries. Here we use the SQL query handler, which is then specific to the data store we use. We use Oracle, so we can do SQL-based queries. There are other possibilities, which are data store independent. So we as well implemented the usage of the OCL query handler. So we have a view here where I can browse the whole application architecture model. And when I open this package, I see all application system UBS has implemented. When we look what's behind this package, we see there is an OCL query which says all application system, all instances, and I have a selection that I just want to see the application system which have assigned children. So this is quite a, a nice feature where we can dynamically change the, our user interface. So back to my user profile. We collect information from different systems so we need somehow to mark from where the information is coming. So each object is a model element, and the model element has an assigned data provider. So we know from where the information is coming, where is the master of the information, because here we're just slave in the repository. Then we have employee-specific information. We have integrated some authorization functionality. We can assign the possibility that someone can edit a CDO resource, which is the same as an EMF resource. So I'm allowed to edit my user profile. That's why the editor is not just read-only. So I can change something. add a commit comment, and the delta are passed to the server, and the new version of the object is now available in the client. I can see this in the revision history, because we use the audit functionality of the CDO repository. With another component, the EMF compare, I can easy compare the two versions of the object and see what are the changes. So 
So there's the out of the box EMF compare editor, and I see that I changed my name, Robert, to my nickname. Then we see here the role assignment. So I'm assigned as software component manager to the tool I show you now. Okay, so now we go to the most impressive part. It's the reverse engineering. No matter from which side I'm coming, maybe I know the application system or I know some specific programs or database table, I can search for whatever I want. I search for some string, which I know this is the database table maintaining all the employee information. So here I found everything which match the search criteria, and I have here a database table called TGOI employee. When I select something, I see the whole component model to which part of our system this physical database table belongs to. The idea is that on the topest level, we just want to have loosely coupled interaction. <coughs> Everyone knew that we have a lot of interaction which do not fulfill those policy, but nobody was really able to measure this. With this system, with the reverse engineering, store the knowledge as models, we are now able to see all the illegal interactions. I see here all interactions, incoming connection to this system, as well as outgoing connection to this system. Everything which is marked red or illegal interaction. We want to know how the situation looks today as well how it looks in the past. So we can compare easily to states in the past and see how the trend of those interaction is. For those who want to see it visualized, we can provide nice graph views from these interactions. We can filter for a specific system, for example, our partner and contract management system, and we can drill down and see all interaction this system has with our specific system storing the employees. Okay, back to the presentation. Important or interesting matrix, the component model we have around 25,000 object with 50,000 references. The model for the reverse engineering, we have 250,000 objects and around one, one million references. Without the scalability feature from CDO, we were, were not able to analyze all these objects with their references. At the moment, we have 50 concurrent user and 2,500 potential users but this will grow when we add more functionality. The temporality, the component model, we have daily updates, around 1% of all the object changes every day. And for the reverse engineering model, we have monthly update because project can deliver every month something into production. Once they deliver something, we scan all the code and apply the changes to our model. So around 20% of the object change every month. And with the temporality, we can nicely switch between different timestamps. 
think interesting is the effort we spend for implementing this solution. I was one year, or maybe one to two year, I was uh, involved just doing research and prototyping, get into the technology around Eclipse. The learning curve to get the understanding and the knowledge in Eclipse is quite hard, but once you understand what is possible, you're quite efficient to provide solution the business requested. What you see here in the demo, this was a two-person project, developing the infrastructure, set up the repository server, all the client provisioning, and implementing those three functional features. And now we are launching a new project with around six person where we want to do forward engineering, the project called Enabling Integration Architecture, and we want to provide the tooling as well with the process and the governance to establish a nice interface management and everything should be based on Eclipse modeling technology. What we learned when we started with Eclipse is that the most the time, or we spent the most time just to understand what's the actual need is of our business. And with the Eclipse modeling technology and the EMF dynamic instances, we can do a lot of iteration with our stakeholders just to understand their problem. Once we have a model which works, we then can implement the editor nice UI integration, unit testing. So I think this is quite interesting slide for where we spend a lot of effort. It's not in the implementation, it's especially in the analysis and understanding the stakeholder needs. So we are since two years, we are looking what's going on in the Eclipse community and features UBS is interested is especially the model evolution. We started to set up a knowledge base of the important assets of our enterprise. We have uh, developed our models and there will be some changes in the models, so we need to possi the possibility to add changes to an e-core model and somehow adapt the current instances we have in the repository. As well, we are interested in the native UML support for CDO. When we go in the direction of integration architecture, our idea is to store reference model like the ISO 220 Swift model directly into the CDO repository. Okay, is there any question? No questions. <laughs> You're blown away. <laughs> okay, then, thank you very, very much for listening.